I want to try this out for a really long time, and today is the day. I want to find out if a mobile phone is any good for photogrammetry. Cue the intro. In theory, a phone should work perfectly fine. Photogrammetry is creating an object out of multiple images, so the lack of resolution from the small phone sensor is not as big of an issue. Of course, that means shooting more images and more close-ups of the object. That's the only way to compete with the clarity of a big sensor camera. For now though, we won't go overboard with the number of photos taken. We'll just focus on the basics, see what we can get out of a phone. In order to properly capture an object surface, we need a polarizing filter on both the lens and the light source. That ensures no reflections on the surface of the object. This will allow us to relight the object later on without any issues. I've covered that in a previous video, so if you haven't watched that, I'll leave a link in the description below. To help with the whole reflection situation, I'll use relatively diffuse objects, so the reflections won't be that obvious. We'll try three objects, a pine cone, this wooden stick, and this beautiful brick. Make no mistakes, even these diffuse objects have reflections, they're just not as visible as shiny reflective surfaces. Since we want to compare the results, I'll be shooting the objects twice once with the iPhone 11 Pro and once with the GH5. It's an older phone, but it's still able to capture a good amount of detail. Of course, with a newer phone, the results will be better. Let's start. For lighting the object, I'm going very simple. I'll take advantage of the natural light, and to fill out the remaining shadows, I'll use an LED light with neutral white balance. To reduce the harsh shadows of the sun and make everything as soft as possible, we need a diffuser. Thankfully, my curtains are white, so they're the ultimate light diffuser. Now, let's start taking some pictures. Right off the bat, I've hit the first snag. iPhone's default lens is way too wide. For landscapes, it's perfect, but for photogrammetry, not so much. Switching to the 2x telephoto lens solves the problem, but the quality there is not as good. iPhone's telephoto lens is not as bright and also has a lower quality CCD, so the images won't be as good as the ones taken with a default lens. The images will be noisier and won't have a ton of detail, but on the other hand, that's all we've got, so that's what we're going to use. The other interesting challenge was finding a way to prop up the phone. Putting the phone on a tripod would move it too far away from the object, so I ended up using a combination of a tripod head and some lens caps. <laughs> a really professional setup, but it does a trick, so I'm fine with it. My other concern was camera shake. Since I can't remotely trigger the shutter, I have to manually press the button on the screen, which can result in blurry images. But this is where the decision to not shoot with polarized light helps a lot. With plenty of natural light, further enhanced by the LED light, the phone won't have to use slow shutter speeds. But if we did shoot things the proper way, I'm not exactly sure how I would be able to compensate for camera shake. The other issue with low light environments is that Apple's night mode gets enabled, and we definitely don't want that. Night mode does a lot of post-processing, which compromises the quality of the image. It aggressively reduces noise and over sharpens the image to give the illusion of detail, so it's definitely not something we want to introduce to our images. I've uh, covered Apple's night mode in a previous video, so I'll leave that in the description below as well. The only way I can think of shooting with a phone and cross-polarized light is to have multiple light sources for adequate light, but also polarizing filters for all of these lights. At that point, having spent this much money on equipment, I don't know why anyone would use a phone for the actual shoot. But that's besides the point. Let's get back to our shoot. It's very important to lock the exposure and focus, otherwise each image will be completely different than the last one, throwing things out of whack. The process is a bit tedious, but with the rotations of the object handled automatically, it's not as bad. Now that the iPhone photos are complete, it's time to shoot the same thing all over again with the camera. Things are much easier here, because there's a lot more flexibility. We can use a tripod, change lenses, basically set up the shot exactly like we want to. And with the phone camera's photos ready, it's time for some processing. A few minutes later. 
And here are the results. I won't tell you which is which right away. Have a guess. The objects as far as overall shape goes are identical. There are some differences in color and detail, but both look really good. The left cone compared to the right one looks like it has a blurrier texture, but that's only if you see the cone side by side. If I disable the right one and inspect cone number one on its own, the texture feels really nice. So, which is which? Cone number two, the one on the right side, is the one made with the iPhone, and cone number one is down with the GH5. You might be impressed by how much detail is on the iPhone texture, but this detail is all artificial. It's just the iPhone being very aggressive with sharpening. You can tell quite easily if we take a look at the bottom of the cone. If we zoom in, what looked like a lot of detail now looks more like a posterized aggressive sharpening. Cone number one's texture feels much more natural. And on the plus side, if we want to sharpen the result, we can. I'll just apply a non-sharp mask in Photoshop and now we have a really sharp result. And if we apply that to our cone, we have a sharp result that still looks way more natural than the one from the iPhone. That's the good thing with images taken with a camera. The results are very neutral and we can fine tune them the way we want to after the fact. With a phone, we're getting a pre-decided result that's always punchier and more processed. In hindsight, I should have used RAW for the iPhone's images, since no post-processing is applied there. But that would also involve one extra step, converting the RAW images to JPEG in order to use them for photogrammetry. Now, let's move on to the next object. Both look good as far as form goes, which is quite encouraging. It means that the images had enough detail to accurately describe the object. So judging by the form alone, it's not easy to tell which is which. If we turn on the textures though, it's quite obvious which one is taken with the iPhone and which one is with the GH5. As with the previous object, the one that looks more detailed is the one taken with the iPhone. But like before, the detail is an illusion. If we zoom in closer, you will notice how much the texture falls apart. The one taken with the GH5, object number two, feels very natural. Once more, the GH5's less aggressive sharpening and higher resolution gives better results. And once we apply some sharpening to the image, we get some nice sharp details. The other dead giveaway is the white balance of the texture. iPhones ever since I can remember always lean into the yellow end of the spectrum. The photos taken with the GH5 have a more correct and neutral white balance. The yellowish white balance though can be fixed relatively easily, so at least the result in that regard can be adjusted. No matter what though, the iPhone result is quite impressive, especially if we consider the fact that a phone's primary function is phone calls and messaging, not photogrammetry. In that regard, this result is mind-blowing. And last but not least, our final object, this beautifully disgusting brick. Ignore this fail the scan part, that was an error on my side. I'm sure by now you can tell which model is done with which camera. Number one is done with the iPhone and number two with a GH5. Here the oversharpening went a little bit too crazy. I might have also underexposed the iPhone images a tad. I'm not sure though if this is my fault. No matter what though, the oversharpening makes the model look unrealistic. The one shot with the GH5 looks much more natural. If we compare the images side by side, you can see how aggressive the iPhone is with the sharpening. So if you're planning to shoot something with your phone, definitely shoot it with RAW and not with a default camera. This will ensure that no post-processing is applied. It will add one extra step in the process, but the results will be infinitely better. So what's the verdict? I would say if we take the proper steps and ensure lots of light and raw shooting, we can get some nice looking objects from a phone. But we definitely need to be more careful than with an ordinary camera. Raw is an absolute must in order to avoid post-processing and any other modes like Apple's night mode. Cross-polarization with a phone is a tad trickier, not only because of the polarizing filter for the phone's lens, but also because of the higher noise floor of the phone's small CCD chip unless we have adequate lights and filters. With newer phones, I'm sure the results will be even better. iPhone 13's macro lens, for example, might be able to capture a lot more detail. Don't forget that more detail means better forms and richer textures. Is my iPhone going to replace my camera for photogrammetry? <laughs> Definitely not. 
But it's good to know that if you're in a pinch and you're willing to follow some basic rules, you will be able to get some good results out of it. And that's about it for this video. How do you think the iPhone fared? Would you personally use your phone to do this sort of thing? Let me know in the comments below. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.